Worlds Deep 2021 Boomer Shooter Con. This is a special occasion indeed because this wave of retro FPS games is going to break sometime in the next couple of years. And if you didn't jump on it at the right time, you're going to get washed out with the tide. Maybe you can retrofit your game into the next trend. Maybe that'll be M-Sims. Maybe the brown piss filtered war games that we've moved away from will make a comeback. Maybe it'll continue to the Half-Life era like Perilous Warp did. I have to do a Perilous Warp video at some point. God damn it. That's another game I've been meaning to make a video on forever, but I have an interesting problem where I make a video on a game and the first comments are in Invariably asking when I'm going to do a different game. Love it. Keep it up, kids. Now, where's Daddy's Nicotine? I want to say for the record that I am not salty that I wasn't invited this year. It's fine. I prefer to humiliate myself on my own terms with my own editor. Katie, how you doing over there? I eat from the toilet. Yes, Daddy. I watched every second in Realms Deep 2021, and the best part was when Mike J electrocuted Ty Brennan with a toaster. Which I could tell during the 30th hour of the stream, the people at 3D Realms had become tired and desperate, and from a community insider, I can tell you exactly exactly what was happening behind the scenes. My source told me of the staff's breaking point. Please, Freddy. Freddy. Please, Freddy, I'm so tired. Freddy, I went to school for graphic design. My wife is pregnant, Freddy. I don't know what Blake Stone is, Freddy, please. 3D Realms was recently purchased by Embracer Group, so now they're under the same umbrella that Gearbox is. That won't save him, you know. Sometimes, that is better. After Realms Deep showed off 150 different games, and some of them weren't retro shooters, the retro shooters market is going to tank pretty soon, maybe even before Realms Deep 2022. And I'm not going to let this channel sync with it, so here's a bunch of boomer shooter demos. First up, we've got a little game called Fae Puti Samurai, which is a procedurally generated roguelite cyberpunk shooter where you enter a portal to your friend's work-in-progress simulation and fight against the evil minions that live within it. And it's pretty fun, you know, good movement, feel, this load sound is bad though, this is bad, and it hurts. You know what they did to me? While I was making this video, they patched it so that it didn't sound like that anymore. Guess I'm just gonna throw the script out now, because that's all my jokes. You get all kinds of weapons. You have access to them in the simulation, but if you collect money and put it in these drop boxes, you can use the computer here to buy more that you can start with, like this revolver. This is my favorite so far, nice and accurate. I can't believe that this simulation includes Hollywood Holocaust, and I guess a little of Red Light District too with all these adult bookstores. The whole time you're out running this wall of glitch that will kill you if you touch it, and my dumbass died to it plenty doing the running backwards and shooting thing. Can't do that here. I really like this mechanic though. I've played plenty of roguelikes and roguelites and procedurally generated snap and slap prefab dumpster fire games where the map is huge and hard to navigate. You don't really have that problem here because the game itself is fairly linear and each section will have its own side areas to explore. But you can't go back, and if you're fast enough, you can outrun the enemies who will get glitched into the void too. I think nearly every enemy drops some kind of weapon, a pitchfork that shoots fire, a few pistols, shotguns. I don't think the elephant drops any sweet, sweet cyber ivory, but I'd have to play more to find out. All in all, this is pretty fun. Wait, what is this? Submachine cat? I'm shocked, shocked to inform all of you that this game has a good flamethrower in it. You know how games do with flamethrowers, they're usually crap, but this one's really nice, very effective. Wait a minute. Waifu bot? Oh my god. White Hell is a drunk simulator with retro graphics that I think most resembles a Wolfenstein-like game, except it's a bit harder. It takes place in Finland. The Steam page says it's post-apocalyptic, which is something I did not pick up on at all while I was playing, which means I should probably reevaluate my preconceived notions about what Finland looks like. I probably won't, though. White Hell is in early access now, with nine whole levels available. In the first maps, you'll fight some invading Nazis. Listen, I know people get upset when I call certain enemies Nazis in video games because they're stupid babies. But look. Look at that. And then look at this. If this isn't giving you Nazi vibes, you probably saw Starship Troopers and thought, oh man, Neil Patrick Harris is wearing an awesome coat. So White Hell concerns the drunk, at least I assume drunk because that's the skill level I played on, and his quest across the frost-covered post-apocalyptic Finland, controlled by one of two factions, the Order of the Blue Eagle and the Red Tomorrow, and this dude is drunk. All the health pickups are beer. The weapons, at first, are pretty standard, a knife, a pistol, shotgun, machine gun, sniper rifle. In this early access version, you pick up a few alternates for these you activate with Sisu mode, which charges up as you kill enemies, and those attacks are crazy overpowered, which is good and necessary because the normal attacks feel a little off. Like, you'll have to get used to the shooting in this game because it's a little different. I wanted to say it was bad, 
but it works as intended and saying it's bad is just me admitting that I can't hit anything. Which is fair if I'm drunk all the time, but okay, let's get into this bit. This is the most important thing you need to know about White Hell. Aside from the fact that ammo pickups are just more guns, the thing about these weapons, at least the early ones and the workhorse ones like the shotgun and pistol, I think this has to do with the slight delay before firing some of the weapons and the seemingly random way enemies move sometimes and the fact that the weapons are so accurate with so little spread that you don't have a lot of leeway with near misses. Look at the pistol and the hitboxes on these enemies when you're moving fast, and in retro FPS games in general, you get used to more generous hitboxes. I'm not necessarily talking like in Quake, where you shoot the air next to monsters and it kills them, and defaulting to a crosshair that's a small white dot is a fucking joke, right? The dot is the best solution because a wider crosshair is not an area you're gonna hit. <laughs> You can parry attacks in this game and knock them right back at these enemies, and sometimes the bullets can also hit these attacks. The shotgun is practically useless at mid-range, but is nice and reliable up close usually. Ammo can be in short supply, especially in the early levels, so you better learn to use Sisu mode properly. Aside from that, I like White Hell. The first few levels are tougher in my opinion, but here's the thing. After the halfway point in this early access campaign, I find that the levels get better. And when the game switches over to fighting the commies, Quake Communists to be exact, there's more of a variety in the enemies and their attacks as well as the weapons. Would you believe that this game has a great flamethrower too? I love the stupid noise they make. The maps can be huge. There's a cool train level, a couple boss fights, this bastard with homing missiles, not the Revenant kind, the Vore kind. but you can shoot them down. Gameplay-wise, it's mostly finding keys or collecting items to progress, but it never really gets confusing, and if you're secret hunting, it's always fairly rewarding. A good start to the proceedings, I say. Wait, what's... Oh. Oh no. No, don't do that. Oh, it's Cultic, the number one game people were messaging me about because it looks like blood. Mine is about 128 colors. You can actually turn this color filtering off, but I felt like it ruined the visual style of the game a little, and what a visual style it is. Do you see all these voxels? This game is published by 3D Realms and developed by Jason Smith and is about a former detective who won't stop digging into mysterious, grisly disappearances in the town of New Grandwell, who goes out to investigate before getting captured and thrown on a pile of bodies. It's more dusk than blood at this point, until you see the cultists and then pick up the dynamite. You know, those classics. So for a game that takes inspiration from other games I love, is this one good? Yeah, yeah it is. It's so chunky. I think that's a good word to describe cultic. Chunky. Meaty. The combat is fast, but weighty. Helped a lot by the sound design. As an example, here's me shooting a cultist with a sten. The game even slows it down for you sometimes so you can really appreciate it. Headshots are important in this game. If you've got a weapon that can't one-hit, like, say, a shotgun or a double-barreled shotgun, which don't share the same ammo pool for some reason, okay, the pistol will headshot with a couple of well-placed shots. And the headshots seem to be tailored to be as meaty and satisfying as possible. The voxel chunkiness works well for a lot of the atmosphere and style, not as much for the pickups, which I don't really know what the fuck most of these are. They glow and are easy enough to see, so the problem is differentiating between them, and that's mostly a problem with picking up ammo. You see all these tensor voxels, but then this one isn't. 
I don't know, man. Unlike blood, these cultists aren't hit scanners, but they might as well be. They have damn good aim and can kill you almost as fast as Chernobog's one-eyed monks. There's cool, rewarding secret areas, and keep in mind this is only one level, but it is one very well-paced level full of surprises. For one thing, how interactive some of this stuff is. You'll see lanterns all over the place. Guess what? They're also grenades. Same with explosive barrels. Thankfully, this isn't as hard as blood, at least not on this hard skill. I hope this map isn't some vertical slice trickery, because it's got really nice set pieces from one encounter to the next. I don't like how you have to select keys from your inventory to use them that way, although I see a lot of potential to use and abuse that for tension later on in the game in the tradition of survival horror. I like games made by one person because you get a really singular vision, that communication directly between designer and player, and also I know who to blame for these fucking bear traps. All in all, this is one to watch. I want this, I want all of it, right now, and I will pay any price for it. Okay, now what we got? Ooh! Surprise, it's Project Warlock again! Project Warlock 2 is like Project Warlock 1, but better. You can jump and, oh, the movement is so very good. It's kind of like build engine game movement, where you get that little bit of feedback when you land and the air control is nice. And unlike the first game, it runs super well despite being like a hundred times more complex. And while a bunch of stuff isn't implemented yet, the movement comes into play a lot more than in the first game, where you would just kind of mow down hordes of enemies. The hordes are still there, but you can jump over them, dodge their attacks. Absolute carnage really pushes you into that sweet spot that few games can, that blissful murder zone. The last one that did that for me was Proteus. And aside from my one gripe that the location to some of the items you need isn't exactly clear, and the level itself is a little hard to navigate and confusing, which would be a point against it if there wasn't a map. There's a map, so it doesn't matter too much. You like some guns akimbo? Project Warlock 2 makes it an ability with a cooldown, and it looks like there will be more where that came from. A+, plus, best in show. Here you go, have a cookie. <coughs> Next up, we've got Kerr, and if you saw the trailer at Realms Deep for Kerr... I kill shit for big swinging suit stuff fuckbags and keep my gob locked up as long as I get paid. It's, it's Robopocalypse Year Zero, and I need that shitting paycheck, so let's venture! Daka 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 daka! One small step for humans, one giant paycheck for mama. Give this guy the slip up and over. Bang a ring! The main character of Kerr does not talk that much. Dear God who made that trailer, that trailer makes me not want to play this game. Thankfully, I played this game before I saw the trailer, so I can give you my thoughts now. This is the early access version of Kerr, meaning it's more than like a one-level demo. It's actually extremely long. I haven't even finished it yet. So there's some jank to it. I don't think they've been able to iron out the basic Unity feel of some things. It's a little light feeling, a little raw, but the focus was clearly on creating a shitload of content for the game, which they did. You're a mercenary hired to go to Mars to shoot robots, and you also talk, and are extremely Australian. Interplanetary travel? We'll triple your normal fee. Woo! Now we are speaking the same language. Where do I sign up? <laughs> Welcome to the Augmented Intelligence Corporation. <laughs> now, when you pick up two pistols, the game calls them Akimbo Pisties. Most of the weapons have fun names, like Big Boy Roy, which is a lightning gun, Mr. Freeze, which is... Yeah, there's certainly build engine influences here. Aside from a freeze gun, you also get a shrink gun introduced in a secret room with shrunk enemies, and by one of the audio logs strewn around with actual voice acting. Steve thinks he's so important. I'll shrink that ego along with the rest of him. Including Shake the Voice. One doesn't just happen upon a position like this, but the brilliant and sane are often mutually exclusive. Who I forgot to mention was Tinklage in Postal 4, despite the fact that literally no one else has a voice like that. There's a lot going on here with the movement. You got boots that let you get some more height if you kick towards the ground, and boot parkour, which needs some work.
There are stations that I mostly found in secret areas that let you upgrade the boot and your character, giving you 400 health, having enemies drop ammo, stuff like that. You're running, you're dashing, kicking. The kicking is thankfully pretty satisfying, because you'll be doing a lot of it with all these enemies carrying shields. Kicking and dashing takes some of your energy, which can be replenished from pickups, or, as I'm almost positive the game did not tell me, by whipping out a Game Boy, spelled B-O-I to avoid Nintendo's wrath, spelled N-E-E-N-Tendo to avoid Nintendo's wrath, even though it looks more like a PS Vita and a dog bone controller. It's frantic and fun and needs some polish. It's kind of like the exact opposite of Cultic in that it's bright, colorful, cartoony, and light. Not everything is balanced perfectly. You get this spider leg weapon, which helps you cut down spider webs in one level, but it's also horribly OP. <laughs> Pretty sure that junkyard is a big detour. And I don't get paid overtime. Better hurry up and get this train back on track. Yeah, this one has a cool train level too. There are so many levels here on offer, like an entire game's worth already, so I can kind of see where the work was going, content, and that's not a bad thing, there's a few bugs to iron out. Like this boss, the first time I played through this section, he'd also go down to the main area, and just wouldn't do that this time around, so I had to kill him here. Anyone there? I think my major complaint about this game would be that some of the levels are a little too big and unwieldy and would benefit from having a map. Like this one, where you have a vent system that'll take you all over the place, to the point of bypassing key doors. But I spent a lot of time trying to find my way around this level after killing everything, even with signs everywhere, because a lot of the hallways look the same. It's still pretty fun at the moment, and I can't remember the last time an early access game came with this much content. Mind the jank. I think you can probably tell from watching this whether you'll enjoy this kind of game. I still haven't finished the whole thing. There's too many of these, I'm... I'm so very tired. But there's one more. Dread Templar, the little game that could, because the first time I played it as a demo forever ago, it was, uh, kinda mediocre. Not bad, kinda stock. But every version I've played since has been better and more fun and added mechanics, weapon and character upgrades, optional challenge areas to get those weapon and character upgrades, and now that it's out in early access, I can take a good hard look at the thing and... You know, as tired as I am of playing retro FPS demos, I did have a lot of fun. The game starts you with a tutorial, katana throwing, bullet time, of course bullet time, look at these two pistols. The bullet time doesn't slow you down, just monsters, and most of the weapons feel really nice except the pump shotgun. It's not the damage or spread of the thing that bothers me, it's that the pump animation is all fucked up and not synced to the sound that plays while you're pumping it, which sucks. <laughs> A cool stun attack, a rocket launcher, a bow that I took to using as a sniper weapon which recharges ammo instead of having pickups, and the bow feels especially nice to use. The atmosphere, at least in this first episode, you know, the one I've played, is a bit quaky. There are so many secrets that I'm apparently terrible at finding, yet I was getting most weapons early. This is the kind of game that requires a lot of weapon switching, which is very smooth and responsive. This feels like the kind of game that would get forgotten among the sea of retro shooters, which is a shame, because while it isn't flashy, it's a very tightly designed shooter that gets everything right. The levels are fairly open, but easy to navigate. The upgrades are useful. Massacring enemies is fun, especially shooting the giant spider with the Uzis. I don't know what it is about this combination of sound and animation that makes this one feel special. The upgrade system can be a little punishing because you need more and more of these gems to unlock slots to place upgrades, three of them to get one of the really cool ones like this. Neo, during bullet time, the damage of the pistol is massively enhanced and does not cost ammunition. Yeah, this one. Whoa. I'll admit I didn't use the katana throwing at all for quite a while, even though the katanas are better than they were in previous versions. So, in an attempt to end this video on a high note, let's do something badass.